Welcome back to Fast Market. I'm Alex Coffey in for Tom White. It's now time for Cash Tag. I'm joined alongside Kevin Hanks, the co-host of Fast Market. And joining us from Likefoil.com is the VP of Research at Likefoil.com, Megan Brantley. Happy Friday to you, Megan. Uh, very fun conversation. Glad to be a part of it here. We're talking some sports gaming and maybe even a little traditional gaming with some casino uh, as well. Specific emphasis, of course, is going to be on Penn National Gaming. But let's start with the high level. I know you guys have been tracking this data for several years as legalization of sports gaming has become uh, more widespread. I have to guess that there's been an uptick in uh, chatter around it on social media. Yeah, so um, some of the names that we're going to chat about today, especially names like Penn, you know, they do have um, a, a dog in the in the sports betting fight, especially through their Barstool Sportsbook um, app and that that digital platform. And when we look at Penn, I think Penn really distinguished itself from uh, some of these other names in our universe, like a DraftKings, you know, like a FanDuel, because they have kind of this trifecta. You know, they have this sports betting arm, but they also have media and the media that Barstool Sports just as a brand generates for Penn. And then they also have casinos. I think they have about 44, you know, actual physical locations where people can go in and visit. And all of these things are kind of working together to really help lift Penn above the pack when it comes to, you know, happiness and also consumer demand. Whenever we look at these, um, you know, if we were to compare Penn and DraftKings and FanDuel, you know, all together on a scatter chart, scatter chart view, you'll see them in that top right corner. And, you know, previously they weren't always there. And part of that is because, you know, in the past year, two years, they really didn't have the casino attendance as a driver. And now they're starting to get that back. When we look at mentions of people who are talking about, you know, going to casinos and visiting casinos, we saw an enormous pop, especially from March to June. I think there was a lot of pent up demand and people really started, you know, enjoying getting back into these places, getting back into this social atmosphere, you know, embracing entertainment. Um, that's just a general theme that we've seen across the board. Now, in I will say in June, we are seeing some tempering. I think those mentions have fallen just by about 6% quarter over quarter, but overall, they're still um, much higher than they were last year. And so that's really providing a nice tailwind for Penn. You know, Megan, going back to casinos and spending more in casinos has been a nice trend coming out of the pandemic. But if I'm looking at these companies, Megan, as an investment and a growth engine, it's got to be the mobile gaming, right? That's where these companies are going to uh, differentiate themselves from brick-and-mortar casinos. Because there's brick-and-mortar casinos. It was Las Vegas. Now they're everywhere. But if you can get young millennials and young people, and, and people all the way up to my age, to gamble on their phone... Now they have an impulse. Now they bet within seconds, right? That's got to be the future of betting and online betting and sports betting and all these things that drive these casino stocks. Tell me where I'm wrong here in that assumption because if I'm betting on one of these names, I'm betting on the one that's got the best handheld or mobile app for gambling, Megan. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. I think that's why, you know, happiness is really important to look at whenever you stack these names up. And we see Penn actually performing pretty well, um, driven by that, that digital platform and that, that Barstool Sportsbook. But, you know, another thing, I think, key indicator for what's driving in that younger audience, like you mentioned, is Penn has such a robust media presence in this Barstool Sports brand. When we look at people who are talking about engaging and consuming Barstool Sports content, that all-time highs of 82% year over year. You know, I think that Penn also made a really strategic acquisition whenever it acquired The Score, which is another kind of sports media brand that is really, really popular in Canada. And so they're able to, you know, draw in customers, um, engage them, and then ultimately get them on their platform to actually start, you know, engaging in sports betting and, you know, online gaming and things like you've mentioned. So I think that this is a really nice kind of attraction vehicle to really get a younger audience engaged. And, and like you mentioned, it will all come down to, you know, who can provide the best experience. But I do think that Penn long-term is probably the best position in terms of all of these names for getting new people in the door just because of the, these media brands that um, are, are really viral. 
And I think uh, this chart you have up here is a testament to that, that, you know, this has been a longer game that uh, the Barstool Sportsbook is employing here. They didn't have the advantage of being in the heart of the daily fantasy sports world like FanDuel and DraftKings, already acquiring a giant customer base so that when this uh, legalization switch happened, they were already well positioned to capitalize on it. This was built on, uh, you know, kind of the backs of the Penn National Gaming's infrastructure and the personalities uh, of the Barstool Sports brand on that media side that you're describing and using some of that customer loyalty ultimately to get them to adopt this sports book. And it's showing now that it, it's, it's showing up on this uh, uh, scatter plot as well. They're uh, up there with the, the, the highest percent positive for sentiment and they're growing at the fastest clip. But I'm impressed that all three of these major players have a, a fairly high percent positive uh, when chatting about this because, I mean, we're talking gambling in the end. And, uh, you know, there's lots of stories about, uh, you know, 11 to 10 built all of this and the fact that the casino has the edge, the sportsbook has the edge. So if uh, your users are happy in spite of the fact that uh, they're getting kind of a raw deal, uh, you're doing something right. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I think that also just the whole concept of sports betting, it's becoming so much more acceptable. You know, it used to, we would put companies like this in, in buckets that we would, we would call sin stocks. Right. And, and now I don't think that it's, it's, as frowned upon per se. I think it's just normal whenever you're watching TV or you're watching a sporting event, you know, people are talking about lines, they're talking about odds and, and this is just part of normal conversation. So, uh, and along with just the normalization, there is increased <laughs> legal access. I think that, you know, the addition of New York at the end of last year, you know, that was a big um, tailwind for a lot of these companies to, you know, develop and expand their sports betting um, jurisdiction. And then I know that there are a couple of other states on the docket, maybe later this year. I know that California is one that people are watching really closely for legislation that may come um, in November. So I think that in general, about a couple dozen states have access to this online sports betting, but that's projected to grow. And so, you know, I think that that does provide a nice, you know, avenue for growth for these companies um, alongside just overall normalization of the topic in society. Megan, one more question, and that is, you know, Penn National has something different than the other casino companies. And whether it's, it's a polarizing thing, Barstool is a polarizing entity, right? They're a little more raunchy, a little more vulgar. They're not the status quo in casinos. It's not tuxedos and black ties. It's more T-shirts and baseball hats. But they are enormously popular. And they, are, they have a cult following in this group of people that like the casinos and like to bet on gambling. What has, how has Barstool differentiated Penn from the other casino companies? You know, I really think that that Penn has just done a really good job attracting this younger audience, att attracting a different audience base, like you mentioned. You know, Penn even noted that this addition of Barstool Sports is actually driving a younger generation into its casinos. I know that they're expanding actual Barstool Sports book like locations inside of physical places. And so this is a brand that's really gaining traction with consumers and, and a new audience that perhaps some, some of the other legacy legacy casinos they don't have. You don't have that access. You know, I, I'm thinking just anecdotally of, you know, what my friend group and people my age would want to engage with. And, you know, we may not be talking about casinos, but a lot of people are talking about Barstool and about things that they've seen on Barstool and yep. podcasts and media that people have put out for Barstool. So I think that, you know, that is something that, that shouldn't be slept on. And at least from our perspective, this is one of those really long-term plays that we think that, that Penn has got right in embracing these media brands to help draw, to pull in that new audience. Well said. Megan Brantley, have a great weekend. Thanks, as always, for joining us here on Fast Market, the VP of Research at likefolio.com. Fascinating discussion.